This is the video for the second part of evaluation, relevance. And what we're going to be talking about here is a little bit in detail about relevant, what relevance means and then how to think carefully about it so that you're sure that you're evaluating it properly. Because relevance is deceptively simple but complicated. You'll see. So just to review, every good argument, every cogent argument is such because it successfully meets three different standards for goodness, right? The A, the R, and the G. We're doing the R, relevance of support. So not only do we have to start at good spots, at acceptable claims, but those need to lead to our conclusion and not off in some other direction, some other tangent. And so you've seen this before. What we're doing now is we're not focused on the starting points of the argument. We're focused on the connections between boxes. That's what relevance is focused on. That's the part of the kind of the visual layout here that relevance is focused on evaluating. So if we have A, that is we start solidly at the tips and every link, every connection between boxes is also similarly solid because we've got its relevance down pat and then we look at the whole thing and we see that we kind of have enough branches then we can be very confident that we have a rational basis to believe the conclusion so the part we're looking at right now are all of these links okay and the key question that we're trying to answer for each one of those connections is does the claim in the box underneath matter to the claim in the box above it that it allegedly supports, right? So when we make a map that looks like this, we're placing boxes according to our initial kind of feelings or the, the arguer's communicated intent about they, they treat particular claims as being support for other claims, right? So we place boxes because they do that, we place boxes underneath, we link them together. That's the analysis part. And then what we're doing in the evaluation part is checking those connections to make sure that they're legit. And the question we're asking in each one of those instances, really basically straightforwardly is, does that claim that they are claiming supports the claim above it, does it really matter or does it not? Does it matter a lot or does it matter just a little? And so this is still kind of vague. We have an intuitive sense about what mattering means, right? Um, but at this stage, with this slide, the only th point I kind of really want to get across here is that this, um, this aspect of evaluating an argument is fundamentally different from acceptability, okay? So, and, and this is really important, we've got three aspects of cogency. An argument, or parts of the map, can be really solid on two of those aspects and fail on the third. And the fact that an argument doesn't do so well on one aspect doesn't mean anything uh, necessarily about how well or poorly it does on the other ones. They're, these are independent measures of goodness and we need all three simultaneously to have a cogent argument right so I'm specifically calling this out because one of the things that people some people tend to really get confused about is they're really unclear about the difference between acceptability and relevance so go rewatch the video on acceptability to get clear about where we evaluate acceptability and what acceptability means we're evaluating a totally different part of the map for relevance and relevance is a fundamentally different thing too so if you're not by the end of this lecture clear on the difference between A and R, we got some work to do, but that's okay. You can rewatch the lectures, you can ask questions in the comments down below, you can come to office hours and talk about this or talk about the quizzes that test A and R and we can work things out there. Or if you brute forced your way through that stuff, we'll be talking about it for sure when you hand in your evaluation of your listicle because that's where mistakes will show up for sure if you're not solid on the difference between A and R and how to evaluate each one separately. Okay, so part of the trickiness with R is that you're already intuitively good at it. In fact, 
you're a little bit too good at it, right? You know relevance, you know mattering when you see it. So here I've got just a stupid, simple argument, right? Where I'm trying to argue that the pavement is wet. I'm trying to argue for the truth of that claim. So imagine that we were trapped inside and you couldn't just look out the window and see whether the pavement was wet or not, okay? Just woke up, you live in an inside apartment with no outside windows, right? And uh, we're wondering whether or not the pavement is wet. I know, these are stupid examples. I'm a philosopher, we do this all the time. Just roll with it, okay? And I have two reasons to give you in support of the claim that the pavement is wet. And one is that it rained recently. And the other one is that it's been very windy. You already know, you've already formed what I think are probably really accurate judgments about which of these two reasons matters to the truth of this conclusion and which of these two is totally irrelevant, okay? Now, there's a couple things that we, that, that, that we have to, a couple reasons why we have to not just rest easy with that strong intuitive sense that judgment you've already formed about which of these two reasons is relevant and which of these two is irrelevant. And the first one is that um, it's okay for you to kind of confidently see in your mind's eye which of these two reasons is relevant and which one isn't, but it's gonna be critically important as a critical thinker, as a persuader, as being able to kind of clearly discuss, present to someone else your understanding of a particular issue, you need to be able to articulate what, why 1A matters, but 1B does not. If they don't intuitively see it themselves, you can't just point at it and go, I mean, can you not, can you not understand why 1A is relevant and, and 1B is not? If you're in a situation where somebody doesn't appreciate the relevance that you see in a particular reason, you're gonna need to kind of hold their hand and, and show them and articulate why that claim is relevant to the thing that it allegedly supports or why it's not and why people who think there is a link between the two are mistaken okay so that's super important and the second reason why we need to be careful about r and be able to articulate it be able to spell it out our judgment is because the very thing that makes um this really quick and why you see it immediately is because system one is doing the work. If you don't know what I mean by system one, go read reading number three, Daniel Kahneman's two modes of thinking, okay? System one is the thing that has that intuition, that gives you that immediate response, that immediate perception of relevance here. And like we talked about in that lecture, generally in the right contexts, pretty reliable system one and quick, so it's all good. But there's gonna be circumstances where it's unreliable and we need to check. So we need to make sure that we're not letting system one drive the bus. We need to make sure that system two, the rational reflective conscious activity, thinking activity that is us, is doing the job, okay? So that's, we need to be able to articulate it to communicate our judgments clearly to other people, but we also need to articulate it to ensure that it's our system two, our rational thinking, that's doing that evaluation and not our reactive thinking doing it because our reactive thinking is deceptively quick and reliable, right? And so it has unearned confidence. So we need to make sure we, so I'm going to be deliberately slowing you down when we're talking about R. Okay, and in fact, I'm with the A and the G too, right? We make snap judgments about the goodness of arguments all the time, and we get into trouble because we rely on those snap judgments, and they have skipped over some important detail that system one hasn't recognized, hasn't noticed. So th the reason why I'm kind of like stretching these out, and we have three things to look at, and each one's got rules and a checklist and all that stuff, Part of that is because, well, that's just what you need to do to be confident that you've made the right judgment. But the other part of it is we're deliberately slowing you down to derail system one and make sure it's system two making the judgments. And once you get practice using system two to make these judgments, as you do that, it's retraining system one to be better. So that as you get more familiar with doing this with system two, 
you actually will stop needing to use system two and you can rely more confidently on system one to do a good job on evaluating relevance or the A or the G part. Okay, so here's how I'm going to slow you down. I'm going to be a really kind of tricky thought experiment because we're going to talk about hypotheticals to help us make sure that mattering is what we're focused on. And don't worry if this all seems like a foreign language to you because I have this super simple example that I'm going to use as my example to show you how what I've got really abstractly here, um, how this is going to work. Okay, So when we're trying to find out whether a particular claim is relevant to another one, whether, a whether one claim matters to another one, the way that we're going to do it, the technique we're going to use is to imagine hypotheticals. Okay, We're going to imagine worlds, and I don't mean worlds like planets, I mean worlds like entire universes. Okay, We're going to imagine a world, maybe the one that we're in right now, where the supporting claim, the allegedly relevant supporting claim, is true. Okay, And then we're, we're going to imagine that we're in that world, and then we're going to say, okay, if I'm in that world, how likely is it that the claim that it supports the conclusion is also true in that kind of world where my supporting claim is true. Okay, so you're holding that in your head. That's one world, right? That's one degree of confidence in the conclusion because you're in that world. Then we're going to imagine a second world. Maybe not this one. Maybe this is the hypothetical one where the, where the allegedly supporting claim is false. Okay, and then we're going to imagine, okay, in that world, in that universe, where that supporting claim is actually not true, what's my confidence that the conclusion is true in that kind of world? And the question we're going to ask with juggling those two hypothetical worlds um, is, is the degree of confidence we have in the conclusion different in those two worlds? Okay, and so my analogy here with the, the, the images is imagine you have a light switch in a room and you have a, a light, a light bulb, a light fixture in a room. And what you're asking, what, what you're wondering is, hey, is that, is that light bulb connected to the switch? That is, does, does the, is the switch relevant to whether the light bulb is on or not? Well, how would you figure that out? You flick the switch, right? You turn it off and on, off and on, and you see if by changing the state of the light switch, you change the state of the light bulb, right? And it could be that flicking the switch doesn't change. Some, something else in the apartment uh, is, is going off and on, right? Or it could be that when you flick the switch, the, the light bulb dutifully off and on it goes, right? And so how the light bulb behaves in response to your flicking the switch up and down T gives you tells you whether the switch is relevant to the state of the light bulb. That's kind of what we're doing here by contemplating these two worlds. One world is where the switch is up and one world is where the switch is off, right? And we're flicking between the two to see if as we hop from one hypothetical world to the other, that the allegedly, the claim that the, that, that light switch is allegedly connected to, is it really connected to it? Or does flicking the switch not matter? Does flicking the switch not change the, the claim that is the conclusion, the claim that is the equivalent of the light bulb? Okay, now that was all really abstract. Even though I provided you an analogy, you might uh, now be even more confused than uh, you were before I started talking about the slide. So I'm gonna say hopefully pretty much the same things as I said here, but with that example. Okay, so here I've got the argument the conclusion, I'm trying to argue that the pavement outside is currently wet, okay? And I've got two reasons. I've got one reason which says it rained recently, and I've got another reason that says it has been very windy. I'm going to assume that we've already done an A evaluation on this argument, and we have come to, you know, accept both of these two claims as being acceptable. So there's they're not controversial. Pretend that they are just, you know, that we've already accepted them for whatever reason, okay? So when we're accepting, when we're evaluating this connection between the supported claim and the supporting claim, right? Because this thing has been positioned under this guy with that connection, because the arguer 
is basically claiming, hey, this, this will help you believe that, right? And we're trying to evaluate whether that is true, whether we agree that there is a nice link here or not, right? So we're gonna imagine a world where the supporting claim, the thing in 1A, is true. Okay, so imagine that world where it rained and the rain just stopped 15 minutes ago, all right? In that world, where it just stopped raining 15 minutes ago, how likely is it that the pavement is wet? Okay, store that away. Now, imagine a world where it hasn't rained recently. In fact, it, it only, the last time it rained was last Tuesday. In that world, how likely is it that the pavement's wet? I mean, it's not impossible, right? But certainly it's less likely than a world where it stopped raining only 15 minutes ago, right? So imagining you're in this world, and then in this world, and then back to this world, then back to this, as you flick back and forth between these two worlds, your confidence in the truth of this is gonna change, right? Probably a lot, right? From almost certain, when you know that you're in a world where it rained recently, to almost certainly not when you're in a world where it, where the most recently it rained was last Tuesday, okay? And so that's what makes this claim relevant to that one, and that's what gets you kind of this evaluation that this strongly supports. In contrast, when my allegedly supporting claim is it has been very windy, right? Imagine a world where that's true, that it's been very windy outside all day. What does that make you, th how likely is the pavement being wet then? I don't know, I don't have any particular belief about that. Let's say 30%, right? Now I'm gonna imagine a world where the windiness claim here is false, where it's been calm for the whole day. What's my confidence, my degree of belief that the pavement is wet? Still 30%? Like it hasn't changed, for me at least. Has it changed for you? Tell me in the comments if you think that is relevant to the wetness of the pavement. I think that would be weird, right? I picked this because I thought clearly disconnected, not relevant, right? Um, and so because flicking back and forth between a windy world and a calm world doesn't really change my attitude, my viewpoint on the wetness of the pavement, that's why this got the gray and the doesn't support thing here. I don't see any connection there. That connection right there is false. It's, it's It shouldn't be there. Right? That's my evaluation of that connection. All right? So just to make sure we're driving this point home here, because it is if, if you're not familiar with talking about hypotheticals and juggling different hypotheticals in your mind, I got pictures for you. Okay? So imagine a world right, where this is true. Then imagine a world where this is true. right? And flick back and forth between this and this. And think about how likely how the likelihood of this changes as you jump from this world to this world and back and forth and back and forth. Super likely, super unlikely that the pavement's wet. Super likely, super unlikely, right? My confidence in this changed, which means that, that the claim about raining, whether or not it's actually true, matters to the claim about the wetness of the pavement. In contrast, different set of pictures, right? Imagine you're in a windy world and then a calm world where the it's hard to get a picture of wind, right? So you got to get an umbrella that's all reversed and then nice calm no no waves, nice glassy surface on the water here, right? So imagine you're in a windy world, then imagine you're in a very calm world. Windy, calm, windy, calm. When you're doing that, then imagine looking down at your feet and looking at the pavement that you're standing on. Is it wet or is it dry? as you flick back and forth between these two worlds. I think it's not gonna make a difference, right? This, the windiness, not relevant, right? Being able to articulate that, being able to understand, ah, I see, I can explain why a particular claim matters or doesn't matter by talking in this language of hypothetical worlds, even though that sounds pretty abstract and weird, this is a very clear way to at least get straight in your own head, right? And be able to articulate and spell out that judgment you have of relevance. 
Okay. Another related way of doing this is to say, okay, I have a green box here and I want to figure out whether or not it actually is relevant. Then I'm going to ask myself this question. Does imagining that this claim is in fact false turn it into a reason not to believe the box above it? So we generally think that, look, if this is true, then that gives me reason to believe that the pavement is wet, right? If I now have reason to think that this claim is false, that in fact it's true that it hasn't rained recently, does that now turn that thing into a reason to disbelieve the box above it? And if it does, then 1A is relevant to the box above it, okay? This also is, this is just a different way of not so obviously appealing to hypothetical different worlds, different possible worlds, but it's, it's doing the same job, okay? If thinking about this being false doesn't quite turn it into an objection or not a strong objection, right? Then maybe it's not strongly supports, maybe it's weakly supports or something like that. If imagining that, sorry, if imagining that this claim is false doesn't change your judgment about this, that is, by imagining this is false, it doesn't turn it into a red box, doesn't turn it into a reason not to believe the box above it, then you can pretty be pretty confident that it's not relevant at all. Okay? But the more flexible kind of general way of thinking about relevance is to think about possible worlds and flick back and forth between these two hypotheticals and see if do, hopping back and forth changes your attitudes towards the, the thing that they allegedly support. Okay. Now, I'm going to describe just briefly here how we do this in rationale so, it's, so that you're kind of prepped for quiz four because in quiz quiz four quiz three the R quiz <laughs> um, because the questions there just like for the a quiz are going to be presented to you as rationale maps and a statement saying something about the relevance stuff that's in there right so in rationale we're going to do this R evaluation in in two steps right and the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to shade reason boxes for relevance. So in the evaluation tab of rationale, there's these three boxes right here that kind of characterize a strongly relevant reason, a weakly relevant reason, and a totally irrelevant reason. So we're going to shade the boxes. Every one of our green reason boxes we're going to shade. We're also going to do it for red boxes, but we're probably not there yet because no listicle has a red box, right? Um, and the second step is that we're going to post what I'm calling R notes that are going to articulate our judgment of relevance. And R notes are the yellow post-it note looking icons in the uh, advanced reasoning building panel. Okay, so in rationale, you build out your map in the analysis stage for when you're doing R. That's how I, I, that's how I picked this and made this a dark green shade with the strongly supports word there and made this one gray with the doesn't support words there is that I clicked on that box and then I clicked on this in the evaluation tab and that's what turned this dark green and turned this gray, right? So that's the shading part. And then I dragged in some R notes, some post-it notes, and I wrote my articulation in the form of a discussion about the hypothetical worlds and how pretending that this claim is false either affects or doesn't affect my judgment about whether the claim it allegedly supports is, is true, right? So it, I'm gonna kind of give you an analogy to the A evaluation, right? The shading part is like the check mark or the X or the question mark that we did in A. That's kind of your overall opinion of the R, the relevance of this box to the box above it. And then the notes, the stuff that you spell out here in words is like what you typed into the basis, the A basis box stuff. It's your articulation of that overall judgment, okay? So the essential idea, what goes in those R notes, how do you articulate that relevance? We have to talk about those possible worlds, okay? And we have to talk, we spend most of our energy talking about the, f the false world 
because the true one is described by that the green box with the contents of the green box right so we say look if I pretend that the, the allegedly supporting claim is false and you really do need to spell out what you mean by false or opposite then here's how I would think about the box above it right and here's and here's why my um, degree of confidence that the upper box um, is now totally different or has stayed the same right that's this is how you articulate that in the yellow post-it note icon box right and so just like basis boxes and what you type in them is not extra reasons our notes also where you type stuff in our notes those should not be extra reasons to believe the thing also shouldn't be extra details expanding on what the green box says nope these are doing a totally different thing these are explanations showing why the lower box matters to the upper box okay so this is going to be a little bit tricky to understand but hopefully the quiz the r quiz is going to give you examples and test you on so that you can start reading some r notes and start judging for yourself yeah that r note does articulate and explain the evaluator's judgment about whether or not the lower box matters to the upper box and then once you pass all those three quizzes you get to do it yourself on your stupid listicle okay the shading is your overall summary so if being in that world where you pretend that the lower box is false or opposite to what it states right if that totally changes your mind about the box above it right then you shade it dark green strongly supports if pretending to um, make that lower box false pretending to be in the opposite world to the way that the box describes the world makes you a little bit less certain of the box above it but doesn't totally change your mind 180 degrees then that's when you shade it light green or weakly supports and finally if being in that opposite world if pretending that the lower box is false doesn't affect your feelings your judgment of the upper box's truth at all that's when you make it gray that's when you say doesn't support okay so again summarizing it's a two-step process here for R you shade all the boxes in every diagram every green and red box when you're doing the ARG needs to get shaded okay but to save you work and to save me grading I'm only going to ask you to provide two yellow R notes that articulate two boxes shadings. You only need to do two. So in the listicle, you have five green boxes. You have to shade all five green boxes, but I only want two yellow R notes. And you get to pick which of the five reasons get an R note. Okay? And that's just to save work. If you can do two of those and you can do them well, that gives me confidence that if I asked you to do all five, you could do all five well. So I'm not going to bother to ask you to do all five so that I don't have to read all five. I can read two and two is enough for me to be assured that, yep, you know what you're doing. Okay. So what's next? Well, hopefully you're going to jump right into taking quiz number three, which is going to test your understanding of what I just talked about. Okay. But again, if quiz number three is difficult and you're just lost there and you can't figure stuff out or if there's a couple questions that seem really you, you can't make heads or tails of them right don't bag your head against the desk don't try and figure it out by yourself alone okay and don't just resort to just grinding through to to finish the quiz and just take it 10 times a dozen times so that you finally pass it and open up the next step in the module don't do that because even though that can work and will work eventually right um, passing the quiz without understanding how to pass the quiz um, that's gonna bite you later and not very much later like tomorrow later okay <clears throat> and it's gonna bite you in such a way that it's gonna sp waste a lot more time so if you have difficulty passing any one of these three ARG quizzes your best bet is to reach out to me figure out what's difficult so that we can solve it because <clears throat> that's going to make things more efficient in the long run and the long run is not that long because it's only a three-week course okay so start take the quiz right after this where all this stuff is fresh in your mind even if it's a little bit jumbled and see what the quiz is like maybe you're going to get 
a little bit lucky or maybe you're a little bit good and you pass it first time through if so excellent if not keep hitting it and see if you can learn how to how these things show up in rationale what they look like on maps and how reasoning works if taking it three or four times has not you haven't passed it then seriously strongly consider putting you know a comment here or visiting office hours or sending me an email with screenshots of difficult questions right so that i can help you out on a one-to-one -one basis and learn a little bit about what might be the stumbling block for you okay because everybody can be different on that so good luck on the quiz here and then on to g